It's always good to get other views about a conference like this. And what we have at the back is a live blogger, a guy called Neil Usher. Uh, Neil is, uh, works with a company called GoSpace, but he also runs a blog called Work Essence. If you don't follow it, I absolutely recommend that you do immediately. And uh, he has also written a great book called The Elemental Workplace. So now I can have two donuts later. Kind of, that's good. Two drinks. So that, that's good. So do, it's workessence.com. So do take, so there was a, there will be two blogs up now, is there? Or three? Three by the end of the day. So I hope you had a very enjoyable break, meeting and networking with people. Or did you feel very alone in a very busy space? Because we're now going to look at this whole subject of designing out loneliness in the workplace. Does a workplace bring people together or does it push people apart? I always say that the workplace is made up by sparklers, people that sparkle the room when they walk in. And then it's, it's also made up of mood hoovers. You know those people. None of you are here today, of course. But we're going to be hearing from uh, Rachel, who's a workplace consultant with Lendlease. Rachel Edwards, a Nigel Osland, a workplace strategist. I've got to read all these. He makes these longer every time. Workplace strategist, change manager, environmental psychologist, researcher, international speaker, and published author. He's no longer a brewer, so I, I can't add that to it as well. We also have to acknowledge the work of Trevor Keeling, who's not here, and Helen Gowland, who's in the audience. Looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Hello, you're all ready for this. And um, Rachel and I are going to take you through a little bit of a journey and a bit of a warning. It starts with some depressing news. But by the end of the journey, we're hoping to uplift you all again. So we're here to talk about designing loneliness out of the workplace. And workplace loneliness has been in the press, not only in the UK, but also a lot of press in Northern America. And it's, it's having a devastating effect. I'm, I, it, it's so bad that in the UK, we now have a commission for loneliness, the Joe Cox Commission for Loneliness. The government has even put 20 million pounds into the pot to help resolve loneliness at a societal level. And we even have a minister for loneliness as well. Yeah, so it's worth checking this out. This is serious stuff. So we have a loneliness epidemic and you can see some of the stats here from the Office of National Statistics. I hope you like statistics, because I'm going to give you a lot in the next few, few minutes. So you can see from the National Office of Statistics that at a societal level in the UK, about a third of us are suffering from loneliness. The co-op, interesting that they got involved in this research, but the co-op uh, and, and uh, colleagues, they actually estimate that in the UK, Across the UK, 9 million people suffer from loneliness uh, regularly. And they also estimate that in the workplace, it's approximately 1.2 million UK office workers suffering from chronic loneliness. So we're going to share with you uh, some of our research in a minute. But again, just a little bit more of the, the information that's coming through from the literature. So loneliness affects us at a personal level, a societal level, and a business level. So at the personal level, this came out of uh, lots of epidemiological studies in the States, and loneliness is equivalent to a 25% mortality rate. It adds 25% to our mortality rate, and that's due to risk of heart disease, depression, dementia, and other factors. So this is quite serious stuff. And also at the personal level, it reduces our lifespan. This is a quote from the chief surgeon in America. So loneliness is equivalent in reducing your lifespan to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And, and, and I didn't believe that number, but when we did the literature review, we checked these figures, and uh, shocking news again. Also, loneliness is a, gives you a higher risk of mortality than being obese and eating too many donuts. So again, just beware of that one. At the social level or societal level, we spend approximately £600 per annum 
per person, per annum, on costs to the medical services. Now, this is, this is in terms of uh, medical treatment, counselling, and, and uh, advising and looking after people with uh, serious, serious loneliness. So, again, a big burden on our NHS. And business, because that's the bit you're all interested in. How does loneliness, workplace loneliness in particular, affect our businesses? Well, again, lots and lots of studies. You, you can actually download our literature review for free. Lots and lots of studies. Loneliness reduces performance and creativity. It reduces approachability, and that's how you approach your manager and how, how you approach your colleagues. So it has a serious effect there, a knock-on effect. It affects your organisational commitment and how, whether you stay with the organisation or not. And that, in turn, has a cost to a business, the fact that people are leaving due to loneliness. It's not just loneliness of themselves, but they may be leaving to look af after their friends and colleagues and, and, and family who also have loneliness. And overall, this can re re uh, resu result in a loss of trust, and again, that, in turn, affects our performance in the workplace. And the New Economics Foundation, they actually put a cost to this. And again, some alarming results here. They estimated that workplace loneliness is costing UK business £2.23 billion per annum. Now, you can see from the slide, a lot of that is due to attrition. So a lot of that is due to people leaving uh, an organisation early, not coming back. So it costs money uh, to recruit new people. It costs money to train up new people. Again, they're leaving not just because of their own loneliness, but they're leaving because they may be having to look after family with loneliness. But also you can see it leads to uh, losses in absenteeism and, uh, and an estimated loss of productivity, which they calculated in various using various methods. So again, a big burden on the UK. So how do you define workplace loneliness? So, so loneliness is a, is a, it's a funny thing because it's a very personal thing. I, I think people, uh, Mark alluded to it, you can be lonely, some people can be lonely in a room full of other people, whereas some people aren't lonely when they're on their own for extended time. So it's us, it's us that determine whether we're lonely or not. It's called a dynamic uh, reaction. So what makes us lonely or not is whether the relationships I want, the interaction I want, actually meets my expectations of those interactions. So it's different for each and every one of us. Rachel. Cool. And I would like to change the mood now <laughs> because the Loneliness Lab is about trying to inspire people to think about how we can change this. Um, about 18 months ago, the Loneliness Lab came up through the innovation pathway at Lendlease. Um, and as a property developer with big urban regeneration projects. The challenge was how can we reshape the environment to reduce loneliness um, in our cities? And it's a really complex issue. So the lab was designed to bring together businesses with government and civil society to incubate these challenges and then share them across a platform that helps to inspire future placemakers to think about the way that they're designing loneliness out of spaces. And there's a number of themes within this that range from residential through to public spaces. And for the past 12 months, we've been working on the workplace. And I should note as well, we've been working with the British Red Cross, who are leading the government policy around loneliness, and also IQL in Stratford, the international quarter, who are using it to look at um, the, the place with um, holistic well-being in mind. And then why, why is workplace loneliness so important? Well, we spend a third of our lives working so the people we meet there can have a big impact on our happiness. And as you guys all know, we're in a bit of turbulence with the way that workplace is changing. Uh, future generations are job hopping more. We've got a rising gig economy. We've got technologies that mean that um, we can connect with people without actually needing to connect with them physically. So our challenge then is how do we start to think about the way we reshape places to help people make these meaningful connections at work? And uh, I'll give you a quick summary of what we've been doing for the past year. So we've been focusing on three activities. We've done a, a literature review, focus workshops, and a, a sort of sample survey. Um, the literature review really helped us uh, to look at holistically at, um, what, what's involved in this from organizational culture through to work styles and work-life balance because it's important that we work together uh, with this. And it also identified a gap um, in the knowledge around what 
uh, the workplace environment can do to help people reduce loneliness. Um, the, the focus workshops were run across a variety of different work styles, uh, from your traditional to agile through to multi-site or organizations with um, multiple sites across <coughs> one city, uh, co-workers, freelancers and virtual workers. And they helped us to really unpack um, expectations of relationships at work, uh, but then also the types of facilities that help people across those kind of intricate work styles connect with one another, so where the, the enablers are and what blocks connection. Um, and then the sample survey was across uh, 527 people, um, and that helped us just to, to make sure that what we were finding from the workshops was uh, correct in our hypothesis. And we're at a stage now where we, we've come up with some, some things that we'd love to explore moving forward into, 20, into 2020, 19, 2020, 2020. <laughs> I've gone back a decade, uh, that we'd like to explore moving into next year um, around how we can sort of make these quite ordinary things a bit more extraordinary. Uh, but the important thing to note with this is we're still really early on in our journey and while we've got these insights, we'd love to start building these into spaces so that we can test them and build case studies that help uh, sort of future placemakers. Uh, inform the way they design things um, and we are open to people helping us with this uh, because obviously uh, it's a it's a really big ask and project. Uh, Nigel's going to start talking through some of our findings. Thanks Rachel. So um, some more statistics from me. So as Rachel explained we, we did a, a very short online survey and uh, we received about 527 responses. So we hope to build that, but right now it was enough to provide a statistically robust sample. So a couple of the basic stats. We used what's called the UCLA loneliness scale. Now the UCLA loneliness scale is, is quite a big scale, about 15, 20 questions, but there's a three question version which is actually uh, promoted, used by the government. So we use the UCLA short version. And also we used what's called the loneliness at work scale. That's a scale of about 30 questions. The UCLA and the LAWS acronyms correlated. So for today, we're just going to focus on the UCLA scale. So you can see it's made up of three basic questions. So your lack of companionship, whether you feel left out, and whether you felt isolated in the workplace. And you can see from all those three pie charts there that we're getting over 50% of people feeling uh, lonely or, or have it failing in some of these elements, these relationships for at least some of the time in their workplace. And when you, um, the, the way the loneliness scale works is you kind of, uh, you, you add the three scales together and you convert it to a percentage score. And again, you can see here that we've got nearly 60% uh, of people on average uh, is the score on the UCL loneliness scale. And anything above 50% is, is uh, classed as bad. So, so we, have, we have a problem. And actually, our, our sample, the um, people who suffered from loneliness often, or from those three scales often, was much higher than the, uh, the, the statistics, the national statistics. So we, um, we've plotted the scores as a percentage on that UCLA loneliness scale. And we've plotted it based on their office location. So whether people are in a small open plan office or small kind of main office, a large main office, whether they're in, dotting around in multiple offices, whether they co-work, whether they mostly work from home, or whether they're a mobile worker, they're kind of in and, ar in and around the office uh, uh, rather than just at home itself. And the interesting there is you can see that in terms of the, the loneliness score, so bad loneliness, lo uh, high loneliness, you can see that <coughs> co-working spaces and home workers suffer from loneliness more than those, more than people who visit the office regularly. Um, which, to be honest, we didn't quite expect to find, uh, but that's the, it is. We can look at it another way, uh, and we can look at, okay, uh, what kind of worker are you? Do you have your own private office? Are you in a shared office? Are you allocated desk in open plan? Do you work in a team zone or around the building? And, and then something called a remote work, the remote worker, which is a bit of home working and in and around the office. And again, you can see the two uh, types of uh, desk type, office type, causing loneliness or related to loneliness are the private office and remote work. 
So um, there's been a lot of bad press recently about how bad open plan is and how good private offices are. Uh, our data, one of the things is finding is that actually the people in private offices are more likely to suffer from loneliness, as well as people who spend time out the office, particularly at home for lengths of time. I'm not saying don't do home working, but for home for long lengths of time, that can also lead to loneliness. <clears throat> so I thought this was also quite interesting. Um, we asked people whether they thought having uh, relationships, friends, <laughs> it sounds like Bill Clinton, having relationships at work, <laughs> people having friends at work, um, um, uh, whether it was important or not. And, and, and an amazing 75% of people, uh, three quarters of our sample, thought that having friends at work was really important. And in terms of the number of friendships and relationships, again, it's quite interesting. We found that on average, uh, for our sample, people knew 62 people on average. They knew kind of uh, office workers, colleagues, recognised them. But in terms of the people they knew, trusted, considered friends, that was only six people. So um, it's back to this thing about loneliness. It's, it, it, loneliness, we quite often say, it's not how many people you know, it's the depth of the relationship. It's not the breadth, it's the depth of the relationship that counts. And you can see here uh, that, that final... Uh, set of figures there, correlations, but we found uh, significant medium-sized correlations uh, between the number of people you know and trust, there was a decent correlation, whereas there was a very little correlation between the whole uh, people that, uh, in and around the space. And the other, fa the other factor that we found that had a strong correlation is we asked people to estimate how much of their work time was spent working alone. And again, we found a significant and strong e effect for the, uh, between the loneliness and the time that you work alone. So, all, I mean, all, all this stuff is in the literature. Our survey is supporting that. It's all, our survey is also used to support what we found in the workshops. And so the final slide from me is we asked people to tick a checkbox of 36 different design features in their workplace. Uh, we're not going to go through all 36 today. But you can see here, I've got the top five that were related to loneliness. So we found that if you had small waiting areas in front of the lift lobbies, uh, that was good for loneliness. We saw lower scores of loneliness for buildings with those features. If you had community notice boards, so simple, so something as simple as a community notice board, you've just got a community notice board saying what's going on and what your colleagues are doing, we found that we had a, a lower rate of loneliness in those environments. Uh, <laughs> Next one, desks without divider screens, a little bit more controversial. I do a lot of work with Page on acoustics. We like divider screens on desks. But in terms of loneliness, people like a clear view. They like to see what's going on around them. Activity spaces and uh, where, where we can use for games and so on are uh, really good for reducing loneliness and also offering informal meeting areas in and around the space, also good for helping to reduce loneliness in the workplace. Rachel's going to go through that in more detail. Yeah. So uh, across all the workshops that we ran, we found uh, four prominent themes emerge in the type of relationships that people wanted to have at work. Uh, and of course, the these, uh, desire for these differ from person to person, but there were, there were four that emerged across all of them. The first one being business relations, the first one being meeting people, and that's about um, <coughs> growing the quantity of people within your network. Uh, the second one, business relationships, and that's about trust. So it might be that person at work that you might not call a friend, but if you didn't have a good relationship with them, then it would have a negative effect on how you feel at work. The third one, social relationships, and that's a bit different to the first two in that it's about creating a friendship bond that transcends beyond anything to do with what you're working on or work altogether. So getting to know someone a bit more personally. And then the last one, belonging. This is a bit of a special one because, um, as many of you know, in um, lots of different uh, human needs models, belonging is classified as a basic human need. And so this is more a sense or a feeling that you're accepted and valued as part of a tribe. Words associated with this from the workshops were authenticity, self-identity, permission came up a lot, and then a bigger sense of purpose within the community 
uh, that you're in. The other thing to note from the, the survey was that we didn't see much uh, correlation between the quantity of relationships and self-reported loneliness, but there was quite a strong correlation between uh, the quality of those relationships. So if these relationships aren't strong, you're more likely to uh, feel lonely at work. Then uh, what I'll do next is I'll, well, in the workshops we ask people uh, to give a list of things that um, help them uh, connect with other people and they walked around and took photos of them and then talked a bit about why and then in the survey we asked people to go through this list and look at which ones related to different types of relationships. I'll apologise first that the photos are taken directly from the workshop so the quality isn't great uh, but then secondly as we're going through it they are quite ordinary things but I'd like you to think about the special thing about them that we can work on in designs uh, to make these ordinary places a bit more extraordinary. So these are just a few examples. Uh, so in meeting people, uh, this is about shared spaces, so uh, being able to prolong time with people uh, outside your immediate team so you can grow your network. Um, so you've got spaces like on-floor tea points, activity spaces uh, for games, etc. Um, and then creating spaces that are, are a bit sort of uh, less intimidating to talk to people. So this one overlaps, so you've got kind of the garden spaces and then uh, kind of activity space. Uh, but I found it interesting that this was at Bureau Happold and they have both of these spaces, but one of them showed up as an enabler and the other one, which is in the basement, showed up as a blocker. So I thought it was quite interesting earlier whenever um, Oliver said that uh, nature can build communities. Uh, and then the other thing that people were quite obsessed with was these, like, the toasters and the printer moments. So this was about being able to connect with someone while you're doing something. So it's a bit less intimidating because you're there for a purpose and you're not sort of hanging around. Um, in terms of business relationships, this was about having those informal spaces that you can build trust and, and a stronger bond with someone that you work with. Uh, so informal spaces that you can get away from the rest of your team to, to really uh, work together uh, came up a lot. So here's some examples of them. This is in the Lendlease offices, so these uh, sort of informal spaces. Uh, and then standing height desks where you can talk to someone within a team area uh, in a sort of non-intimidating way because you're both at the same height. Uh, and then again, just in contrast, these open meeting spaces uh, were shown as an enabler and then the boardroom as a blocker because it's a bit more formal and intimidating. Um, and social relationships uh, tend to happen whenever you can uh, identify a common interest or lifestyle with another person. Uh, so uh, again, sort of breakout spaces with long tables, uh, spaces for activities or multifunction spaces for kind of extracurricular activities. Um, I was at uh, another conference yesterday where they brought up a stat that cycling reduces loneliness and, um, and I, I thought back uh, uh, and I added this one in because uh, although cycling facilities didn't come up very strongly, it was uh, one of the recurring themes for all the workshops, people who cycle make friends in uh, the cycling space. but. As you guys might know, they tend to be in the sort of deepest, darkest points of buildings. So how can we design them to prolong people spending time in them and connecting with other people? I also uh, saw something last week where um, there's a cycling facility designer who are designing uh, sort of storage that you can remove during winter and turn those spaces into other things. So. Uh, and then it's not just about uh, the spaces, it's also about the activity overlay. So having spaces that you can advertise, the extracurricular activities. Um, in British Red Cross, they've got sort of a, a really easy to make Instagram app to shout about what they're doing together. And then in the International Quarter in Stratford, they've got a platform where it extends out to the neighborhood. So they build the community beyond the organization that people work in. Um, and then this looks nothing like Laura, our community manager, but it's really nice having someone on the ground who can help people uh, connect with one another. Um, uh, around a, a sense of belonging. Um, so I'll just give you some examples because this one was interesting. Sometimes the, the simplest things to implement uh, come out the strongest. Uh, so in this one you can see community boards, whether it was for projects or people came out the strongest. 
uh, and some examples here are the first one in Elephant and Castle, uh, ways to introduce sort of new team members with the baby elephant so people can see them uh, and they can sort of integrate into the team. It doesn't need to be expensive. British Red Cross did it uh, just by sticking Polaroids and a bit of glass. And then the second one is from the workshop we had in a co-working space. They had a bit about people next to the tea point. So when you're making tea, you can see who you're working next to and sort of start up a conversation. And then the last one I took uh, at Hay Cafe in Elephant and Castle, and that's got dogs. So workplace doesn't work doesn't always happen within your organisation. Lots of people work from cafes, and if you see a dog in there, you can know its name and start up a conversation with its owner. I think that's quite uh, good. Uh, but then also really powerful is project spaces. Um, and, and this is about having the permission to talk to someone about their project because you can see it on the wall. Uh, and through that then, uh, getting a bigger sense of purpose about what you're doing with, and what other people are doing in the same company as you. Um, and so my, my point here is I'd really advocate for people to not look at this as uh, just a, a nice to have. This is somewhat of a necessity whenever it comes to, to building that bigger sense of purpose and ultimately loyalty in staff. Uh, so uh, we think that uh, we have the opportunity to make a big difference in this space and when there's probably people from lots of different industries in this room, I think we all have the opportunity to do that um, and we'd love for you to get involved in your, if you're interested in this. Uh, we're in the process of putting together a toolkit that people can start to do what we've done within their own organisations. Uh, so a really easy to use uh, checklist uh, that will have all the findings that we've we've uh, found so far, um, a tested workshop approach, so the same approach that we used and we can uh, talk you through how to do that to identify within your own organisation, maybe uh, some quick wins and then some bigger interventions that you might like to try. Uh, what we've found as well is just by doing this, which is it's, it's fairly simple to do, uh, but by doing this we've started people talking about it more, so reducing the stigma. Uh, and then we'd love to continue the conversation with you. We're holding an idea hack where we'll bring out the full list of things we found um, to, to try and look at how we can make those simple things extraordinary. So that's on the 19th of November. And if you'd like to come to that, please also get in touch. Um, but the workplace isn't the only thing we're working on. So if you're interested in any of these areas, I'm happy to put you in touch with the people leading those teams. Thanks. Thank you very much. Any questions at all from the floor? Hi, um, thank you very much for this presentation. I just wanted to know how much of this has to do with sensitization of people themselves? Because I've been in buildings which are like this, which have all these open spaces, which have all these areas where you can, I mean, talk to people, play with people, but people still don't do any of those things and people are lonely. So then how much of it is sensitization of people to realize that people need to speak to people um, and then obviously have these as the nudges, tying it back into like the first, one of the first presentations that we had earlier. So that's what we're trying to really get under the skin of and we're still quite early in the journey and we need to, to do that through testing with people. Um, I'll take a, an example of this sort of the toaster. So everyone sort of has a toaster, but but is it something to do with the location of the toaster, or is it what's around it? So we're we're not really sure yet, but uh, that's what we need to sort of work through. There's and um, in, in, in when you look at the literature, there's quite a lot of literature on how you manage spaces, how you build relationships with people, how how do you encourage people to to break down those loneliness. Uh, and so on. So, so actually there's, there's quite a bit of the literature that actually covers that aspect of it because it's no point just creating the spaces you've then, so, so my example is there's no point creating a multifunctional space which can be used for yoga, sports or social activities. You've, you've got to then as an organisation encourage people to adopt those spaces and use them. So I think the two go hand in hand. This project is particularly focused on the, on the design elements that can help, as you said, nudge the behaviours with the proper management. Is technology making the matter worse? Oh. I.e. you stop to get face to face, everyone's doing it yeah. on tablets, on mobile phones, you don't communicate so much. From what we found in online literature and I guess uh, 
the, the more I work from home, I, I feel a bit lonelier. Uh, so yes, it could be, and it is seen as, as a bit of a contributor, but um, what we're looking to do is understand how through designing the physical space, we can encourage people to, to spend time together as well in person. The, I, th I think similarly interesting, I, I personally, I, I do think technology comes to play into this a little bit. And, and some of the, I, for me, the interesting examples are things like social media. So people, oh, I've got 300 friends on social media, but that's breadth, that's, there's no depth to any of those relationships. So, pe so I think people are mistaking those links on LinkedIn or whatever as, as kind of ties, whereas actually there's no depth to them or meaning to them. And I think that's where maybe technology isn't mm. helping us. So but at the same time, technology is doing uh, some great things in, uh, say, for uh, like elderly care or people who are a bit more disadvantaged in getting out of the house. It's helping them to, to connect. And I know that's coming up a lot in one of our other streams and also in the, like the social platforms that help people to identify activities or ways they can engage. But there's d definitely a need for this sort of person-to-person -person engagement uh, to build sort of yeah. that sense of belonging. Thank you. There's two more questions. Can I take the one that's over oh. over there, right at the back there, please? Thank you. Okay. How many uh, people were surveyed as part of this process? Because for me, in your pie charts, the, the numbers are quite alarming. Yeah. Um, and I, I just want to kind of get under the skin of how many people you've actually surveyed as part of that. So, so our survey was quite relatively small. It was 527. But the, but the numbers I showed you at the start were actually the national statistics thousands and thousands, national surveys. They, they include the uh, questions as part of a, a regular national uh, poll. So uh, if you think of our numbers, actually most of what we found was very, if, if, it's that, if that's the right way around, but we, we were doing our survey to verify the workshop findings, but actually we found similar results to what we're finding at a national level. So, so I guess where I'm coming from is the fact that I'm an end user and we've got 4,000 staff. And if that was the figures for our business, I'd be kind of quaking in my boots, to be, yeah, quick, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. yeah and you'll, you'll, you'll see that uh, there is still quite a big stigma to it. So a lot of those uh, articles that you saw at the start were about people not wanting to talk about it. So, so in holding the workshops that we've held, that's where we found that people start to open up a bit more. And uh, I mean, the biggest thing would be building a culture of caring from the beginning. So I think we need to start changing the way we think about it. So as we said, it's a, it's a big problem and it's scary numbers, but there are solutions. Uh, okay, last question. Yeah, just have you considered a cross-generational issue, age, oh. with regard to things? Because, yeah. I mean, I've worked with people who are 70, down to 15 or 20, and I found that peer pressures or social pressures where people actually don't want to communicate or feel that they're, you know, social issues. Yeah suddenly they talk to older people. It's a bit like the kindergarten kids going into the older people's things and both of them things. So I'm just wondering if there's cross-generational diversity, does it help the communication and people feel less social pressure to interact yeah. and communicate with each other? Um, I, yeah, I mean, uh, the, sorry, there's lots of questions in that one question. I mean, first of all, the, the national literature, weirdly, it, uh, it shows that younger people suffer more from loneliness than older people, and that's because they tend to be moving to a new town in a new workplace, they might be in rented accommodation in an area they don't know. So it's all those little factors rather than age per se. It's those, all those little factors that uh, have, have an age effect. Whereas of course el elderly people, they're more likely to have lost loved ones, family, and therefore they may suffer from loneliness. I think the other thing that's happening in the workplace is that we, 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 in the old days, Pat, we used to join an organization for 15 years and stay there and we'd have lots and lots of relationships and friends through that time. And I think now we, in a more transient society, the gig economy and so on, we're kind of in and out of, of work and we're not building those long-term relationships so much as we, we, we maybe did years ago. Um, there is some studies out there saying how you can get the generations to, to interact, but generally the, they, they kind of, it doesn't quite work. They kind of stay in their own tribes, if, if you want to call it that. Thank you very much. Thank you.